Welcome back to the Trade and Climate Change Conference. A reminder that each session of this conference will include simultaneous interpretation in English and French. Please ensure you have selected the correct language that you will listen in, either English or French. To select the appropriate language, please locate and click on the globe icon on the bottom taskbar of this window, or more if you are on a mobile device, and select either English or French. And remember that you can ask questions of the presenters by using the Q&A function at any time during today's session. I would now like to introduce our moderator for this session, Karen hogan Kazira, who is president of Varesco Solutions. Karen? Thank you, Martha. Welcome everyone to session five of the CAPI UFFF uh, virtual conference. Um, I think the last session, session four, ended on a very good note that led to a good segue to the discussion that we're going to have today. Um, and this is corporate ambition on climate action, uh, which is where I spend a lot of time with corporates working on uh, the, the ambition that they are scaling. Um, so I will be your moderator for this afternoon. And these particular companies that have come together have pledged ambition, are actively uh, finding ways to interact with growers in their supply chain and producers in their supply chain, and are navigating this uh, complicated world of climate policy um, and you know the, the recent priorities announced by the US administration and the Trudeau and um, Biden summit that happened last month. Next slide, please. So the conference has been discussing a lot of things around government policy, domestic policies, international policies, but there's a big landscape out there. And Jonathan in the previous panel mentioned a seismic shift in ESG or environmental, social and governance that's happening in the corporate world. So since Paris, what we see is an alignment of global standard setting organizations and civil society actors coming together to develop measurement and disclosure frameworks under the carbon disclosure project, reporting frameworks under the greenhouse gas protocol. And many of these corporations have gone through and calculated their global carbon footprint uh, across their supply chains. The science-based targets initiative, which is really sort of setting the, the, you know, the targets to reduce. And, and in the era of Paris, this is about opening up private sector investment. And can you click on the next one, please? So there are very aggressive value chain targets being set by a number of sectors globally on reducing their emissions by 2030 and by 2050 in line with Paris and the science-based uh, targets. So a lot of the food and beverage companies that we are all familiar with that operate globally uh, across landscapes, across countries, have pledged significant reductions. When these companies calculate their carbon footprint, they find that 60 to 70% of their impact is upstream in scope three, where they purchase from farms and, and ranches and, and beef operations, for example, or milk operations. And so that has been a real catalyst for change and in our, the view of myself and, and people who work in this space, it is an opportunity to scale investment um, and measuring that carbon intensity. So we've talked about, you know, some of these carbon border adjustments might be based on carbon intensity of goods, um, you know, traveling back and forth across borders. This group of companies, and there are many of them, there's 1200 right now who have committed to set science-based targets, about 600 of them have, they are tracking carbon intensity across their supply chains and investing on farm to make emission reductions happen. Next slide, please. Here's just an example. Um, Science-based targets is one of the pledges. You could see after Paris how many companies are working on setting a science-based target. There's the Renewable Energy 100 Club, and then we're seeing a massive amount of carbon neutral pledges and net zero pledges on zeroing out your residual emissions that you cannot avoid or reduce in order to meet your carbon neutrality pledge. And so there's over 1200 corporations, 140 countries, 50 cities, suspects that you are not the usual suspects. Next slide, please. 
So the value change, I mentioned those civil societies who are working towards how do corporates quantify, verify, and claim impacts toward their science-based targets. This is guidance that develop, is developing globally. And there are many companies, corporates who are piloting to determine how they can report against their carbon footprint and their science-based targets and investing in their supply chains, including upstream on farm or downstream on farm if you're an agri-input supplier um, to be able to meet that challenge. Next slide, please. So this isn't going to go away. The horse has left the barn and we see corporates globally committing to these things. The key question we probably want to explore here is, and it was raised in the previous session, how do governments and corporates work together? The corporates will likely have a lot of the tracking mechanisms and monitoring, reporting and verification for carbon intensity that may be needed for good global trade policies. So this is a question I think this is a very good panel to explore. And with that, I will introduce our first speaker. I would like to introduce Nadia Theodore. Nadia is Senior Vice President, Global Government and Industry of Maple Leaf Foods. Nadia will tell you um, how Maple Leaf is a leader in this space and the activities that they are undertaking currently um, across their organizations, farms, and plants. Go ahead, Nadia. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Karen, uh, for that warm introduction. Uh, it is really uh, a pleasure for me to be here today, this afternoon with, with all of you. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint, and so I apologize that, you know, many of you would probably be happier looking at a PowerPoint presentation than looking at me, but I'm, I'm what you get. So, um, <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, and, and, I, and I will actually, before I start, um, apologize, start with an apology, because I do actually have to um, make my presentation, take questions that that folks might have, and then, uh, and then I have to jump off before the panel discussion um, is, is fully uh, completed, because uh, as many of you might know, we are in a global pandemic, um, and uh, the issue of vaccines for our essential workers at Maple Leaf Foods across Canada and the United States has been taking up a lot of my time and I uh, and I have to run to a meeting which will hopefully uh, move the needle forward on that for us and, and I just I couldn't uh, I, it's with somebody that I couldn't uh, couldn't move so uh, so I, I, I start with an apology um, but uh, but very very happy to be here um, so I thought what I would do is sort of frame my, my discussion with you around three buckets. Um, first, to give you a little bit of a one-on-one, -on -one, one -on -one around Maple Leaf Foods um, to sort of kind of ground us in, 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 in the company. And then talk a little bit, as Karen very wonderfully set up, what our passion and our vision is for our action around climate change and sustainability efforts. And then um, talk a little bit and hopefully start a little bit of a conversation around um, kind of the intersection that I'm most interested in, uh, not an expert in by any means, but definitely very interested in, which is around how this, this vision around climate change and this desire for action around climate change um, really matters to companies that are particularly dependent on export markets. So this whole idea of trade, um, when we talk about climate change and sustainability efforts, particularly by, by companies. Um, so what does what does Maple Leaf Foods do? Um, and, you know, I kind of I love to answer the question, who, what is Maple Leaf Foods? Um, because I think that for our company in particular, um, it can really be broken down in a similar way to kind of how people kind of define how we define ourselves as people. Right. It's kind of what do we do and then who are we? Um, and you'll see when I go through these two that the who are we is very closely linked to the conversation that we're going to have today and that we've been having, frankly, throughout, um, throughout this wonderful um, conference uh, related to climate change issues. Um, so what does Maple Leaf Foods do? So we are a company that produces high quality prepared meats. Um, we um, we um, produce 
value-added fresh pork, chicken, turkey, and plant-based protein. We have facilities that are located across Canada, in Quebec, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Alberta, and Ontario. I'm always afraid that I'm going to leave out a province inadvertently, so I always have to count on my fingers, uh, and, and across the United States. Um, this includes 12 prepared meats facilities, uh, two further processed poultry facilities, two fresh pork facilities, five um, fresh poultry facilities, and two plant-based protein facilities that many people don't, don't know about, um, and distribution centers, pig barns, uh, registered independent poultry growers, um, and a few hatcheries. And across Canada, this company that has been in existence for over 100 years has really been a staple on Canadian breakfast tables, in school lunches, and on warm summer night barbecues um, under, under the great Canadian sky. Uh, and we do business in over 20 markets. So I like to say to people that we are Canadian born, but globally made. Uh, and then there is the who we are. And this is obviously connected to what we do, but even more connected with what we want to be and where we want to go. Um, so many of you might know that we are Canada's largest meats and poultry producer. And we are actually the leading private label supplier for retail and food service as well. We are a team of over 13,000 employees that have a real commitment to connecting and reconnecting families with the goodness of food. And our company purpose statement says it all. Our company purpose statement is raise the good in food. Um, and you know, maybe I'll just take a minute before I connect it to uh, our company's position on climate change and talk to you a little bit about those initiatives. Uh, I'll talk to you about you know, the four principles that our purpose is really anchored around because I think that as I go through them, you're going to see that they are all in some way linked to our goals and our positioning and our thinking around building a better planet. So number one, the principle of better food. So we endeavor to make real food with real ingredients, eliminating artificial colors, artificial flavors, and antibiotics. We believe in better care. We strive to build an industry leadership uh, in animal care through uh, research and advancements in training, transparency, and accountability. Uh, we strive for better communities. So we value a culture and a work environment that really keeps our people safe. We have a strong commitment to workplace health and safety um, and really have it at the forefront of everything that we do every day at work. And we're also committed to advancing sustainable food security. And many people don't know about our Maple Leaf Center for Action on Food Security. And then number four, we believe in a better planet. Um, we are pursuing very ambitious goals to reduce our environmental footprint by 50% by, by 2025. And so I wanted our little icon added to, uh, to the slide that was shown at the beginning of, of, of this session. Um, so, you know, what we, who we are is a company that makes protein products that is that a, a company who is purpose driven and that believes really in the possibility of shared value when it comes to the Canadian agri-food industry and in particular as it relates to climate change. Um, and so, you know, now I'll, I'll, I'll kind of shift to give you a little bit of a position of, of um, a position on climate change. So our, our company's position on climate change and sustainability, and then talk a little bit about the trade implications. And, you know, I think that that last principle that I laid out, um, the one of better planet is really a good segue into providing you with a snapshot of our company's position on climate change and what we think it means for, for our business, for our business today and for our business in the future. 
Um, you know, maple leaf foods is truly out front in terms of our position on climate change and sustainability. Um, the vision of our company, our, our North Star, our vision statement that you can find uh, on our website, right front and center, is to be the most sustainable protein company on earth. Um, and we really have taken that very seriously with concrete actions that we believe operationalize that vision, that commitment, but that also represent opportunity for us as a globally minded company, uh, provided that we get the domestic and international systems and rules of engagement right, which we'll talk about. Um, so what have we done? Uh, I'm gonna walk you through um, maybe two initiatives uh, in, in the interest of time that I believe really have, well, two sort of buckets of initiatives, I should say, that I believe have the potential to have the most impact um, and where I think trade and trade related issues uh, and the ever increasing discussion on the space and place of trade and sustainability and climate change action efforts are going. Uh, and before I, I start, I really do have to say and underscore that I am not a sustainability expert. Uh, I'm not a climate change expert. My, um, my expertise is actually in, in trade policy and expertise, I use that word loosely. Um, and, you know, my, um, my, my expertise, I suppose, or my background as it relates to environment and climate change and sustainability has really been in, in, in past lives um, in my work at the World Trade Organization as, uh, as Canada's negotiator for the environmental goods negotiations and the APEC EGS uh, negotiations way, way back when, when that was a, when that was a thing. So it, ideally, uh, Maple Leaf Foods Vice President of Sustainability that I feel like I have to give a shout out to, Tim Favory, who um, is, is fantastic and really, really an expert in this space would be sitting next to me and, and tag teaming with me. But hopefully I can give enough of an overview that really allows you to see the link between trade uh, and to trade and frame, frame the discussion, at least from a Maple Leaf point of view with regard to climate change and, and, and trade issues. Um, so I'll start maybe by what we see at Maple Leaf Foods to be perhaps our single proudest moment as a company in our sustainability journey. In 2019, we proudly announced that we became the world's first major carbon neutral food company. And along with that, we became only one, we became one of only three animal protein companies globally to set science-based targets, which was talked about during the introduction, you saw the, the logo there, um, aligned with the goals of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change and the only food company in Canada to set science-based targets. So we really feel like this is one of our proudest moments as, as a Canadian company, as a Canadian food company, to be the only major food company in the country to set those science-based targets. Um, so what does that actually kind of mean? What does carbon neutrality and carbon management look like for us? Um, you know, a few examples of actions that have helped us are really sound centered around principles of avoid, reduce, replace, and offset. So we have avoided building new processing plants in areas that have little or no access to renewable energy sources. We continue to improve our efficiency in our plants, um, in our animal feed and crop production and reduce distribution trip lengths for our products. We switch from carbon intensive to low carbon sources, for example, by investing in renewable energy and electricity through new power purchase agreements. And for emissions that we cannot otherwise reduce, we are looking to offset those. Uh, and, you know, a couple of sort of facts for you to sort of ground those four principles. Since 2015, the company has reduced our water usage by over 1.2 billion liters. We've reduced more than 86 kilowatt hours of electricity, which is the equivalent of 12,912 passenger vehicles driven for one year. 
and over 4.3 million cubic meters of natural gas, which equals annual energy usage of about uh, for about a thousand homes. And so the other big rock for us is our commitment to the circular economy for plastics. Um, over the past few years, Maple Leaf Foods has really been working on a comprehensive sustainable, sustainable packaging strategy, which is really multi-pronged. It's about reducing the amount of packaging that we use. It's about our commitment to recycling uh, and reusing as much as we can um, where we cannot eliminate the plastic because of food safety concerns. And then it's really about um, also teaming up with partners in the space that are working with governments on initiatives that are going to see these types of strategic partnerships and these kinds of strategic actions really um, multiplied across the country and around the globe. So the goal of the strategy is really, again, to reduce the overall amount of packaging materials that we use where possible, to source materials with high recycled content and shift to fully recycled material materials where when we can over time. And you know, another proud moment, recent moment for us um, along that journey is that in January of this year, we joined the Plastics Pact, which is many of you might might have heard of it. Um, it's a network of local and cross-border initiatives that bring together key stakeholders to implement solutions towards a circular economy for plastics. Um, and what's kind of cool about this initiative and the pact is that the goal is really um, to, to, to unite business and government and everyday citizens behind this common goal. And so each initiative that each local um, network or regional network undertakes is really led by an organization that is looking to unite the three groups, the government, the business, and then citizens behind this common vision to respond to plastic waste and pollution. Um, and then the last initiative that I will uh, kind of just touch on briefly um, in, in this bucket of circular economy is an initiative that we undertook a few years ago um, as a company. And it's a partnership with an organization called How to Recycle. So it's a standardized labeling system that provides instructions to consumers for proper recycling. And so over the past few years, we have been exploring collaborative opportunities with how to recycle and that program so that we can help to amplify voices uh, of business that are really looking to inform consumers and customers around, um, around the importance of recycling. Um, so, I picked those examples for a reason, um, and many of you might have kind of guessed the reason as I was going through the examples, uh, because, you know, the, the idea of supporting ways towards carbon management and carbon neutrality um, and a variety of initiatives around labeling so this carbon management, carbon neutrality, and labeling um, are really two issues that are going to be part of and are already part of the discussions around how the trading system will matter for businesses who have a global footprint. Uh, and in particular, over the past few years, uh, there have been increasing conversations around rules and regulations related to environmental sustainable sustainability labeling, and certainly lots of conversations around carbon border adjustment taxes um, and, 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 and the like. And so, you know, what is Maple Leaf's position on these, these issues, these trade related issues um, tied to climate action, sustainability, um, environmental action. 
you know, I can't pretend that Maple Leaf Foods has policy positions that are all kind of neatly gamed out and tied up in a bow as it relates to carbon border adjustment taxes um, or putting a price on carbon or a carbon tax, whatever, you, whatever you'd like to call it. Um, because the fact of the matter is that I think, you know, like all trade issues, frankly, uh, and in particular, those related to agri-food and agriculture, it, it's complicated. Uh, and certainly for a company like Maple Leaf Foods, who truly, um, as I said at the beginning, truly is a values-driven company or strives to be a values-driven company, that really has, um, you know, an ulterior motive, um, which is to help try to save our planet uh, and to do our part as a company to make sure that, um, that our planet is left in better stead for those that will come after us. Um, it's complicated, right? When you, when you combine that with business and, and investor relations and, 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 and all the rest. Um, so, so I thought what I would do is kind of outline a few principles that I think that all of us, Maple Leaf Foods, other companies, governments, and I would say, you know, even investors and citizens have to keep in mind when we are thinking about ambitions around climate change and sustainability, especially for companies or for countries that have companies that are, that are based in their jurisdictions that depend both on domestic and global markets. Um, and yes. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, we don't have any questions coming into the Q&A. So I'm encouraging people to put your questions in the Q&A because Nadia is going to have to leave. And we'll only have a few minutes for questions for Nadia. So if I don't see any questions coming in the Q&A, Please continue because I really want to hear your principles. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll, I'll, do, I'll be quick and then to, to make, have time for a okay. question. Sorry. I timed myself, but, you know, I tend to ramble. Uh, <laughs> so, so three, three, I'll, I'll, I'll say three quick things, okay, around the principles, the trade related principles. Number one, rules based. Um, so, Maple Leaf Foods really believes in a rules based system. We believe that climate change is a global issue um, and that to tackle this global urgent issue, we really do need countries um, to work together. Um, and so we believe that a rules-based international system that really takes into account and has conversations around climate change is important. And that to the extent that issues are like carbon border, um, adjustment taxes that are going to be used for, for, for exports, right? For exports, imports, not within, within a country. Um, we really do need to have conversations amongst our countries in order to get that right, which of course is complicated. Uh, predictability, nobody around this table um, is, is naive to the fact that for companies, for business, the number one thing for success, the number one thing that drives success is predictability, predictability of the rules, predictability of the action, predictability around what government expects of us, what government is going to do to support us, that whole conversation around being able to understand and to, to, to invest in um, initiatives that we know are going to be meaningful for our success 10, 15, 20 years down the road because we are all aligning on it for the future is very important. Um, and then the third thing that I'd say is science-based. Um, and I say science-based um, you know, because I, I told you about our, our commitment to the Paris Agreement and science-based targets, but I also believe that um, setting science-based targets and centering ourselves around a science-based approach to these things is also key for ensuring that companies are treated equitably and that we really have a, um, a level playing field 
um, around, uh, around issues related to climate action, climate change and sustainability. Um, and so I'll, I'll leave it there so that, so that there, there are time for questions. Thank okay, you. Okay, perfect, because we're at the bottom of the hour. So there are some questions coming in. Um, they're in the chat. I got one in the chat and one in the q and I'll start with the one in the chat. Um, Alejandra asks, can you give us some examples from Maple Leaf in terms on actions in agriculture and climate change? And I would think that she was asking maybe about how you interact with your, your producers um, and your farmers on the ground might be a good, is that, I think Alejandra was sort of saying that because you gave us examples of other things you've been doing corporately. Yeah, so, I mean, again, you know, our, our interaction with our supply chain is one where we hope that our actions corporately are going to be um, sort of a catalyst, so to speak, um, for, for action by our farmers and our, our other suppliers. And so, you know, of course, you know, for example, we are a North American leader in raised without antibiotics pork um, and a leader in, in, in Canadian poultry. And so, of course, our relationship with suppliers that provide us with raised without antibiotics um, fresh product is one that we that we take very seriously. Um, and, and, you know, I would also say that the relationship is also one where we hope that we are providing high quality inputs um, into, into the supply chain as well, right? So we um, own 201 pig barns um, and three hatcheries, and we are always trying to um, build systems in our in our in our in our um, um, plants and in our barns and hatcheries that have a view towards reducing emissions that have a view towards uh, efficiencies, etc. Um, the other thing that I would say is that you know, and this is kind of in our infancy stage uh, at Maple Leaf Foods, but you know our um, vision around offsets um, is one where I believe that as we get more mature um, in developing that offset um, uh, initiative, those offset initiatives, um, we will have more opportunities to have strong partnerships with farmers who are also very interested in both the um, the, the, the climate and sustainability um, piece of offsets, but also the market opportunity around offsets, right? Um, because, you know, we, I, don't, I don't think it's, it's a bad thing um, to acknowledge that this whole um, offset market is one that obviously is going to be good for the environment in the long run and help us drive our, our ambitions around climate change, but that also provides market opportunities um, and economic opportunities for, for businesses and, and for farmers alike. Okay, I'm gonna allow maybe two more questions and then we'll have to let you go, Nadia, and get on to our other speakers. Yeah. Um, David Hill asks, how might Maple Leaf drive increased profitability to its suppliers and growers yeah. as it deals with its net zero and climate change goals? Well, David, that is a good question. And, you know, if I had the answer to that, I would be, if I had the perfect answer to that, I, I would be very well loved. Um, I think, you, you know, that's kind of the magic, the part of the magic sauce, right? Um, and, and, and kind of the, 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 the thousand dollar question. Um, you know, I think, I think that more than anything else, you know, we are part of a supply chain that smack in the middle of growers and suppliers and then, and then consumers, right? Um, and sorry, if you can hear my daughter screaming in the background, I apologize. Um, and and I, 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 I think that the way that we increase our profitability as we, um, continue down our journey towards net zero 
is really to understand that A, the consumer um, is going to want these things, right? The, the consumer is caring more and more around dealing with the entire supply chain that cares about sustainability and driving climate change goals. Um, and so by virtue of us being, being the middle sandwich that hopefully pulls both of, a, along, um, hopefully that kind of the, the downstream effects of being um, a supplier of choice, a grower of choice um, is, is felt by all. Uh, and then the other thing that I would say that's perhaps more tangible is that, you know, when we are, the, the, the actions that we take to reduce our emissions, to be more efficient, um, at the end of the day, it's cost saving, right? It, 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 it drives cost saving for, for our companies. Um, and so I think the same thing is true to the extent that we um, that, that we are driving cost savings as, as we try and reduce our emissions um, and, and become more efficient with the goal of helping, you know, helping drive climate action and sustainability. Um, those same, same cost savings are, are shared amongst the entire supply chain. Um, you know, not, not, an easy, not an easy answer, frankly, and not, again, you know, that's kind of the magic, the magic question, the million dollar question. Okay, Nadia, we probably want time for one more, but I'd just like to interject and say that these are early days. Um, it takes a company about two years to do its footprint and get its, you know, under, identify where it wants to work and then set that target. And those targets are not smart goals. Those are transformational goals, transformational in the way corporates do business. And so once you've got it, now you've got to think about how you're going to affect change within your supply chain. So, you know, I, the, the passion that you guys have, Nadia, is amazing. And I know you'll get there. So, so we have one question from Christopher. Nadia mentions carbon borders. What does the future of greenhouse gases as a non-tariff trade barrier, or indeed as a tar tariffed trade barrier look like? What jurisdiction in your view might first pursue such as a rules-based or unilateral system? Yeah. So if I was to guess uh, which jurisdiction is going to pursue that next, I would say, you know, the, I think maybe many would say that it's going to be the Europeans, right? I think that they really have um, leaned into this as a, as, as, as a, a group of countries <laughs> um, and as a rule setting body for a group of countries uh, like no other jurisdiction, right? Um, and, and, you know, the future as a non-tariff trade barrier, complicated, let me tell you. You know, really complicated and really, um, you know, I see it as the next, and maybe some will get this and some won't, but I see it as complicated as the next, you know, the next fish subsidies issue as it relates to trade, um, you know, um, on the, on the non-tariff barrier side. Um, because I, because I really believe it's going to come down to this idea of countries really taking a stand on the fact that this is, um, climate change is something that we have to tackle. That is really and truly one of those issues that falls within, um, you know, the protected areas that countries are allowed to regulate around kind of um, relatively indiscriminately again uh, on, right? I think that there will be arguments to that very soon. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think it's gonna get, I think it's gonna get really complicated, which is why and I'll, my final thing, cause I'm gonna have to make a plug for, for, for my passion, which is why I think that the World Trade Organization is gonna be ever, ever important, you know, despite its challenges. Um, and despite its reframing, I think that we are going to need a body that is going to be able to have that has the infrastructure that's going to be able to deal with these non tariff trade barrier itch issues like GHG, GHGs and, and others that are going to come up around climate change uh, and sustainability issues. Thank you, Nadia. Really enjoyed. Thank you. Now Thank you. you. Have I'm sorry, I got to go. Yeah. And then the safety issues. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Bye. Wish me luck. All right. Yep, cheers. Wish you luck. Okay. Um, we'll move on to our next speaker. 
Our next speaker is Sarah Dean. Sarah is the Global Public Policy Manager of John Deere, again, another purpose-driven company with operations globally. Sarah, would you like to begin? Thanks very much, Karen. And um, let me first just say thanks to Farm Foundation and CAPI for the invitation and the opportunity to participate in today's panel discussion on such an important topic. It really is a pleasure to join everybody um, to share some of Deere's sustainability story. Um, I probably don't need to say this to um, most of those in the audience, but you know, John Deere is a global leader in agricultural, earth-moving, road construction, forestry, and turf equipment, and has provided innovative technologies and solutions for our customers since we were founded um, almost 184 years ago in 1837. Um, we have operations in over 70 countries, excuse me, 40 countries around the world and sell our equipment and solutions in over 100. And, you know, Deere is committed to our customers um, by providing the equipment and technology solutions that enable them to execute their jobs efficiently, profitably, and in a sustainable way. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so John Deere's higher purpose, and we, we just refreshed some of the, the words here recently um, as part of our new sustainability report that just came out this past February. And I'd, I'd encourage anyone who wants to learn more about um, kind of the breadth of sustainability activities that, that Deere's engaged in to, to take a look at our website um, where you can find the report. It's 80 some odd pages long, so <laughs> we, we can't go into everything today, but I think it really does give um, a, good, um, a good insight into all the different types of things that, that we're thinking about um, from a company perspective. Um, but you know, this, this higher purpose statement here, you know, we run so life can leap forward is really our core mission. And I think it says a lot about um, the company and what we aspire to do in working to enable our customers to support um, the, way, the way that we live and, and how we operate in the world, whether it's growing food, building infrastructure, building houses um, and the like. And you know, certainly when we think about trade and climate and increasing populations, um, the need for increased agricultural output, to meet global food security needs. You know, this is really, I think, a driving purpose um, to enabling that we have um, the agricultural output that is needed to ensure that we are able to feed um, the population that we have on the planet and to do so in an environmentally sustainable um, manner. Um, we, we do this um, by leveraging our advantage. Oh, I'm sorry, Morgan, if you can just jump back for a second. Um, you know, we, we do this by, um, focusing on our manufacturing and our engineering and our technology um, and by focusing on our customers and the relationships we have with them to understand um, how it is that they operate and what are the steps that they take across their different um, tasks and jobs that they do so that we can tailor the right solutions um, for those customers, be they smallholder farmers in parts of the developing world to large commercial um, operations in other markets. And so therefore we can provide the right solutions and um, equipment for any operation of any size um, that there is. And by having this focus, I think on our customers, you know, we're really focused on um, thinking about how new technologies and connected machines can help to um, speed up, I think, this process as we try and address some of the sustainability challenges and how do we ensure that we have greater productivity with a, um, a smaller environmental footprint at the same time. Um, next, Morgan. Thanks. And so, um, you know, in 2020, we went through a, um, kind of a strategic review and came up with a new strategic operating model that we've rolled out um, that has three essential building blocks. And this sort of has everything in the company that is now focused around these areas of our production systems, our technology stack and our life cycle solutions. And you know, as, as I touched on really the focus here is making sure that we have that depth of understanding of our customers and the work that they do across every step within the production that they're doing, be it 
growing um, a food crop or building a road to be able to um, help increase their productivity with the equipment and solutions we're providing. When you, you couple that production system approach with our technology stack, which is you know, enabling a, a layering of the different types of technology that are now being developed and are, are in the market, whether you think about hardware and devices, embedded solutions and embedded software, connectivity, data platforms, and other applications. And by coupling these different types of technologies, we're able to help unlock economic value for our customers, enabling them to be more, um, more productive and more profitable. Um, and then finally, life cycle solutions. And this is um, an area where we, we think about, you know, how do we support our customers and the equipment they have across the entire life cycle of that piece of machinery, regardless of when they purchased it. Um, and so as equipment is becoming more connected and more technology, technologically advanced, um, this becomes more and more important to ensuring that um, customers are able to take advantage of the value added services and performance upgrades. Um, you know, regardless from when they purchase that piece of equipment. And so this new smart industrial operating model is really, I think, driving a lot of our focus on how do we, as I said, provide the tools to enable more economic value for our customers while being more sustainable at the same time. Next. So then just turning a little bit on, onto the technology side here, because I think this is really where there is, um, and, and we at DEER think there's a big opportunity of the adoption of precision agricultural technologies and how these are really transforming the agriculture sector and enabling um, greater environmental sustain sustainability um, for growers. You know, we see automation, machine learning, intelligence, and um, other precision technologies as ways that are really increasing the role that agriculture is playing in being more competitive um, in global markets for growers, um, no matter where they're sending their products, but also more sustainable at the same time. And a piece of that um, sort of enabling environment to, to support these, the adoption of these precision technologies is around connectivity. Um, and that's connectivity, not just to the farm gate, um, you know, there's a lot of conversation about connectivity and rural broadband um, for schools and um, workplaces. And that's certainly something that has become even more apparent and important over the last year as we have all moved to this kind of virtual COVID world that we're in, but also getting connectivity to the field because having connectivity enables the machine-to-machine -machine transmission and um, applications of a lot of these new precision type technologies that are enabling greater precision and greater sustainability. Next. And, and so sort of building on that a little bit, you know, when we think about these smarter automated machines that are driven by data, um, that internet of things that sort of takes all of these different aspects of, of how we think about data and machinery is um, really providing that additional opportunity to focus on um, the efficiency and the um, minimizing some of the environmental impacts um, from various agricultural practices. So whether it's predictive maintenance, remote management, or other types of data flows, those are all aspects. There's something that we've done for a long time with equipment, um, you know, sending data into the cloud, but also by sharing information from um, our, our customers that they can share information between machines within their own fleet, that enables um, better predictive um, decision-making and enables that, that greater sustainability. Uh, next. And so here you see a little bit, this, this slide is a little, um, it's got some, some actions built in there, but, but I think the, the, the main piece here again is that you know, by having the connectivity and building upon a lot of these precision technologies, we're enabling growers to be more efficient, more profitable and more sustainable at the same time because of a lot of these, um, these new technologies. And one example I think I would, I'd, I'd share is, um, you know, if you think about high definition cameras 
or um, advanced sensing development and uh, intelligent learning algorithms on machines. You know, there's a lot of focus around um, automated cars and um, self-driving cars. Well, that, that's been happening in the agriculture space for, um, for a very long time. Um, and you know where we're where we're learning a lot, and I think providing a lot of value is um, within these different sensing te technologies. So in in 2017, um, John Deere purchased Blue River Technologies, which is um, a company that had a expertise in camera vision and machine learning, um, and used facial recognition to just differentiate between a plant and a weed. And so these types of technologies, as they're now coming into the commercial market today, enables um, growers to spray precisely the weed rather than having more broad acre spraying or spraying plants, which has a dramatically um, reduced uh, use of um, pesticides or other types of chemical ap applications, which certainly reduces some of the environmental um, footprint of a particular operation well. And so we see as these technologies continue to be developed and continue to be adopted by growers, that they're only going to increase the ability um, of understanding the environmental um, footprints in some of these operations. And I think the technologies that connect to um, when we think about some of the new um, carbon offset systems and other types of protocols and the verification that's going to be required, you know, the, the machinery that is following a lot of the applications that growers are doing are, is going to be a key for enabling them to take advantage of some of these opportunities that are opening into the market as well. And thus having a kind of a broader um, understanding of their operations and, and more, um, more efficient, more productive, um, operations, but also with a, a lower environmental footprint. Um, next slide, Morgan. And then just to sort of touch a little bit um, kind of more on this about what, what does this mean? You know, so we think about all these technologies that, that we have in the market and um, you know, how they are producing sustainable outcomes for our customers um, while you know, kind of reducing environmental impacts on soil, on water, on air quality. And you know, a lot of these technologies are some of them are things that have been um, in the market for, for two decades, you know, things like GPS guidance and auto track. That's that's not a really new technology, but other other types of sensing technologies are, are much newer. And so when you combine all of these together, you can really have um, a, a huge amount of um, opportunity to understand the farming operations better. And if you go to the next slide, um, Morgan, and this is the last one, and this just gives kind of a high level snapshot. And um, we can talk a little bit more about this in, in the Q&A if, if people are interested in um, more of the detail behind um, some of this analysis as part of our uh, recent sustainability report, we did um, some model analysis based off of a model farm um, this would be a 6,500 acre farm in the Midwest that would be a, a row crop operation for corn and soy. And by looking and, and using six different um, precision technologies that are currently available from John Deere, um, you know, if you're thinking about GPS guidance, section control, um, and, and other types of applications, across the whole year of a production cycle. So from the preparation phases that a farmer goes through to the planting, to the protection phases, to harvesting, and throughout the management of all of this, um, by using these different technologies, um, we found that, again, for this model operation, you could add $40 per acre of economic value um, to the grower by reduced fuel, reduced fertilizer, um, reduce use of seeds because of better management of where things are getting um, planted, um, as well as emissions avoidance because of um, you know, fewer passes of the machines that's required. And that could be the equivalent of up to um, a million passenger vehicle miles um, for a production cycle. And, and this, I think, is um, it's just really exciting um, work that we're starting to try and understand and try and see how can we help our customers um, with the tools that they need um, and the data and the information that they have for their operations to be able to um, 
understand what's happening, but also, as I said, to take advantage of some of the, um, the opportunities that I think agriculture does have in order um, to help address some of the climate challenges we have and where we can think about um, carbon offset markets or sequestration or other types of areas where agriculture has a really positive role to play. Um, the, the last thing I would just note, um, you know, from, from Deere's perspective, we certainly have um, sustainability goals that cover a wide range of other topics, whether it's um, energy efficiency, water use, um, product sustainability, um, thinking about the materials that are used in our equipment, um, occupational health and safety, and, and others. But I thought for the discussion today, it would be really um, you know, interesting to sort of talk a little bit more about this technology piece, because that's really where we think, see um, that we're in a little bit of a, of a different position than, than some others across the broader value chain of being able to provide some of the solutions and the tools to help our customers um, be able to adapt as, as the world is changing. So um, with that, I'll say thanks very much um, and look forward to the, the rest of the discussion with the group. Thanks. Thanks very much, Sarah. You know, I think of the initial opening comments on this conference by the two speakers, Professor Blandin and, and Aaron Crosby, and they both emphasize technology, how important this will be, but they also emphasize for an emission intensive trade exposed sector like agriculture and farmers, that they may not have a direct impact at the farm level, but that farmers need to understand how they can deploy these kinds of technologies to minimize their trade exposure because the inputs will be priced higher and come down the pike. So really enjoyed it. Technology is, is a big part of this play. And so we'll explore that in the Q&A. Thank you. All right, so our next speaker is Jorge Zarate and he is um, the Global Operations Lead of Engineering and Logistics VP of Grupo Bimbo Global. Jorge, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Karen. And uh, thanks to Farm Foundation and CAPI for having me here and as well representing my, my company, Grupo Vivo, and, and allow me to, to spend some, some time just to give you a background of who we are and how we are connected with the sustainability. Uh, our company is a 75 years old company. The picture you see here is the, the, the original founders. And actually the company is still in, in, in the managing uh, managed by the, by the same families. Uh, the only one alive is the first one, Don Roberto, the second of uh, uh, the former CEO of the company, the second one. And uh, so uh, this is to tell you that this company is family-based. Uh, nowadays it's global, it's, it's international, but uh, uh, with very strong foundations on, on a family-based company. We are a, a public company, but with a very small floating uh, rate uh, around 20 percent, 80 percent is still on, on, on hands of these these families. Can I have the next one, please? So uh, today, after 75 years of uh, effort and, and growth, uh, Grupo Vivo is now the, the leader, the global leader in the baking industry. For, for those of you you haven't heard, you're going to see our brands, then probably you're going to recognize us. Uh, so nowadays we have operations in 33 countries uh, through. 203 uh, manufacturing sites uh, that could be bakeries, could be confectionaries, could be snack uh, manufacturers. And, and our business model is producing, then sending the products, the goods, the final goods to distribution centers or sales centers. So uh, uh, as, as uh, globally, we, we hold 1700 sales centers, uh, around 60 distribution centers as well. And that is to serve directly in direct sales distribution model to almost 3 million point of sales in all these 32 countries that we, we serve. This point of sales that could be mama pop store, corner store, or a hypermarket. So in that range, we move. So we, we, we are in every, every, we try to be in every place. And we do this uh, through, through what we call sales routes. So let me explain you a sale route is not just the vehicle that is transporting our goods, but also the driver who also happens that is our salesman, that also happens that is our commercial assessor for the clients that we, we serve. Uh, so uh, among all the company, we are 133,000 associates uh, working for, for Grupo Bimbo. And last year, we had a revenue of more than, than 15 billion, billion US, US dollars. Can I have the next one, please? 
So these are our main brands. Uh, we have very, a, very, a very strong brand, brand portfolio. As you can see in your, your um, uh, 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 left is uh, the, main, the main brand that they are more than, than 1 billion uh, size on, on revenue. But then we, we have several uh, level of, of brands. All of them, these ones are the most important ones. We have much more on, on, on those. And uh, through these brands, we distribute more than 10,000 SKUs in, in this in this in these countries that goes from from sliced bread, uh, uh, artisanal bread up to snack cakes and cookies, um, going also with the, with the snacks and, and, and candies. Can I have the the next one, please? So uh, we, we we do have a very strong financial performance. Uh, this is a, a, just the picture for last year that despite the the pandemic, we were able to grow six point six percent on 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 our revenue. And almost 13% on our EBITDA. And that, of course, it was a special year, uh, uh, but uh, that allow us, allowed us to, to continue our profitable, profitable growth as has been in the last uh, 75 years. So, and uh, this is also to mention that uh, since the beginning, because it's a founder's mentality for, for our founders, that uh, most of the, the, the earnings from the company has, has to be reinvested in the, in the business. And our, and our average of reinvesting is uh, almost the 80 percent that we reinvest. So that's why uh, only a family uh, that family that keeps on the business they can hold on on, on keeping reinvesting and reinvesting and not have not not taking out their their money from from there. So this is the, the reality that we have faced in the past 75 years. Next. So uh, how how is that we are uh, the, the world uh, uh, leader on, on the baking industry? So this is just to simplify in, in four blocks. Uh, the North American block, which is uh, uh, I mean, the, 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 the reason why we're speaking here today, where we have uh, 78 uh, plants and uh, the countries that I comprehend uh, on this block is Canada and USA. We are leader in eight categories of, of, of baked goods in this, in this side. The other uh, big chunk of our business is Mexico, uh, where we have uh, 38 plants. Um, including bakery, snacks, and, and so on. We also le are leading eight categories in, in, in these uh, big goods. Uh, then we have Latin America that goes from Central America up to South America and also Brazil. So in those, in those countries, uh, we have 32 plants uh, spread, spread up among all these uh, countries in this, in this section. And then the fourth one we have is uh, Europe, Asia, and Africa, where we have 55 plants. Just to mention in the next slide is uh, when I mention a plant, there are several sizes of, of plants. Uh, a plant could be plant with just one production line, or could be a plant with eighteen production uh, plant, uh, production uh, lines. So to, to accomplish this and to keep growing, we leverage on our philosophy, which is to build a sustainable, highly productive, and deeply humane company. This has been our our uh, philosophy for uh, since the, the founders founded the. The company, and there has been a place in action through what we call the golden rule, which is treating people with respect, fairness, trust, and, and care. That is very important for our our uh, philosophy, as you're going to see ahead. Next one, please. So the mission that uh, we we try to to, to achieve is uh, to put delicious and nutritious uh, baked goods and snacks in the hands of all. So this is our ultimate desire as a, as a mission, as a company. Next one, please. And uh, we, we do that through strong beliefs, our values as a company, which the first one is we value the person. The person is what, what is in the center of any activity we do as, as a company. So we value the person and we believe and truly believe that we are a community. We are just one community, no matter that we are in 33 countries and 11 business units, different business units. Uh, we try to get results everywhere. In all the places that we, we serve, uh, we compete. We know how to compete and we win. We, we always have in mind to win. Uh, also, we are very sh uh, sharp operators because we, we hold basically from uh, the transformation of, uh, of the raw materials up to distribution directly to the clients. So we are sharp operators in that, in that regard. And uh, we act in everything we do as, as the business with integrity. Uh, among all the value chain. And uh, we transcend and endure where our sustainability, 
strategy uh, stays uh, uh, trying to transcend and endure. Next one, please. Then we have a, 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 our main purpose is to is nourishing a, a better world. And, and to do that, uh, we do have a, a, sustainability, a sustainable strategy. It's the next one. Uh, so to, to nourish the world, we, we strongly believe that uh, we exist as a, as a food company to, to nourish a better world. Uh, that means that uh, we have to nourish in the well-being of the people, but as well of the planet, the nature. And uh, this is the only way to, we cannot do it separately. We have to go uh, in, the same, in, the same, in the same way in the, uh, this, uh, together on this. this uh, we know this is a very bold ambition and it's not an easy journey to, to take, but uh, we have a plan to go there and uh, we have goals to, to accomplish and we will, we will do it with the help of uh, all the value chain as we just saw with, with Sara, having uh, the, the, the agro as well, working on the same, on the same, the same page. Uh, also for, for um, the product that is, is food, we provide more diverse nutrients and uh, simple recipes to, to provide uh, health and wellness to our consumers as, as, as well. Um, also in terms of uh, degradation of, uh, of, the, of the nature, we, we, we try to, to become a zero carbon champion uh, of the regenerative agriculture. And we're working on that with our suppliers in different countries. And uh, in that way, we help uh, the communities that we serve uh, to, to, to empower them that, uh, so they can help us on, on when, when they are sowing, when they are sourcing and, and selling to us their, their raw materials to, to produce our goods and transform them for uh, sweet, sweet baked goods or, or products for our markets that we, we serve. So that's, that's the, the, what our belief that uh, we can all be stronger together. That this is not a task to be done uh, individually by governments, uh, companies, or, or parts of the value chain. Everybody has to be on the same page and work on, on that. Focusing on what are we doing on, on the American, North American footprint, uh, let me go deeper on, on, on this. But basically, uh, the three countries uh, which are the top, one, uh, these three countries are in, the, in our top five countries, of course, in terms of revenue and, and, and EBITDA for, for the company is Mexico, which is the, the, our mother, mother company, uh, United States and, and, and Canada. And in that, uh, what I can tell you is uh, together, uh, we have 116 bakeries, 42,000 routes that I already explained to you to serve almost 2 million uh, point of sales among all these, all these uh, three countries. And uh, for that, out of our, our 133,000 associates, 100,000 are in these countries because, because they're one of the largest uh, part of the business that, that we have. And uh, talking about plants, some plants are, are small, some plants are big, but I can tell you that uh, in these three countries, we have 450 uh, production lines out of 900 that we have as, as, as Grupo Bimbo. So you can, you can see how important for us is, is North America uh, for, for our future and for our, our growth. Can I have the next one, please? So this, this growth that has been in the past uh, 20 years, first was uh, organically growing in Mexico and some countries in, in, in South America and Central America. And then we also have uh, the strategy of uh, not just going greenfield, but also joint ventures and also uh, acquisitions. So this growth gave us a lot of benefits of uh, this uh, buy side products of our world is valuing the diversity that we have in countries, cultures, and, and uh, ways of uh, even products. Uh, that is allowing us to replicate success across other geographies, bringing the best practices to other places so we can together can, can, can help even the societies and the communities that we serve, but as well our company. And uh, we are learning every, every time uh, that we uh, grow in a, in a country, we learn how to operate in this uh, and compete in these different market uh, conditions, which are uh, totally, totally unique. Thank you, please. So we have some results in sustainability that I would like to, to, to mention just quickly, just to, to, to food for thought. Uh, in the carbon footprint uh, uh, issue, can I have the next one, please? Well, in terms of connection, that uh, I'm glad that everybody has mentioned this, it's very important to, to use the technology so we can uh, help our, our supply chains to, to improve. And uh, bakeries is not, a, is not an exception. We have been working on connecting our bakeries among the, all the supply chains that we have. 
But in terms of sustainability, we've been lately connecting also the, the water, gas, and electricity consumption through, through meters. So that can give us uh, the, 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 the way to, to improve the efficiency of our operations. So now we have 13 sites connected, 61 production lines connected on that, collecting already information to capitalize that information and, and, and through business analytic tools, uh, start to communicate for better de decisions and improving the, the, the profit and the growth of our business, but as well improving the climate uh, change of the, the communities that we are serving. Um, also, we are sharing the, the, the best practice that we find in different, in different countries. We use them as a global mandatory uh, uh, action to take in every place that they don't have them. That has allowed us, for example, in the last year to reduce 5% in the thermal energy uh, compared with uh, 2019. As well in distribution, uh, we have been um, uh, improving the uh, distribution through, through routing, uh, um, um, dynamic routing, so we can reduce the kilometers that our distribution is, 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 is moving. And that, that, that is allowing us also to to reduce the emission through, through our distribution because we are a DSD, the direct cell distribution system. Can I have the next one? Um, so in terms of energy, also that's, a, that's an aspect that we've been working uh, lately uh, in the past years uh, very heavily. Uh, the United States already connected with a wind farm that is providing 100% of, of renewable energy. Uh, the first one was Mexico actually with, uh, with what we call the wind farm of Tierra Larga which is providing us 70% of the, all the electric energy that we're consuming in, in Mexico. Then also we have Chile uh, that, uh, and, people, and in Mexico also we are uh, accomplishing or increasing the renewable uh, ener energy usage through uh, solar panels, what we call Bimbo Solar, that is giving us uh, sites with, with, uh, with um, for example, the Chile one is, is in our plant there, which is a, is a large plant that is the largest solar roof in, in South America. And in Mexico, you're going to see we have a distribution center that is also uh, very big, that, is, uh, uh, that has the solar panels that is the, the largest in, in, in Mexico. In Peru, we already started uh, using uh, hydroelectric energy, and the rest, 80% now, is uh, being providing the energy for, for the whole company, but the rest is going to be uh, accomplished with the solar panels as well. This one, which is another examples. This is what I was mentioning when Argentina already with the wind farms, 100% renewable. In Mexico, this distribution center that is also solar panels in the roof that is giving, providing the 100% of this automatic warehouse. And also we are testing and trying and rolling out the power banks technology in some sites so we can accomplish by 2025 being 100% renewable so we also uh, we committed with the RE100 initially. Next one, please. And in terms of new technologies, as, uh, uh, we have been uh, uh, commenting uh, because the fleet distribution is a big issue for us. We've also been alternating uh, technologies uh, to, to reduce our carbon impact. So uh, we have uh, 1,100 electric vehicles already serving in, in the market we have, uh, 1,300 natural gas vehicles, 177 ethanol vehicles, 545 propane vehicles, and 88 hybrid. And this is uh, just the beginning. We have still a long way to, to, to go. But today in Mexico, for example, we are the largest electric fleet in, in, in Mexico, in the country. And uh, this is something that uh, commit us to, to continue working on, on, on this. In refrigerants, also we have the commitment to, to gradually reduce the impact uh, by, by using uh, uh, more environmental uh, 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 friendly refrigerants. And uh, we hold the first hybrid ammonia and CO2 system for a for fabricant, which is in Chicago, which is a frozen model. And uh, well, this is also a long way to, to, to go, but uh, we, we aim to, to finish on the transition uh, 2025 to 2020 to 2030. And uh, so altogether, what we uh, try to, to get is with our purpose of nourishing a better world, using our mission, uh, which, which is uh, uh, placing delicious and nutrition, nutrition with the goods and snacks in the hands of all, to build a sustainable and highly productive and deeply human company. Uh, this is uh, something uh, hard to, 
to 100% fulfill, but always uh, trying to, 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 to get closer and closer every, every time we can. I think that is the last one. Great, thank you, Jorge. Very good. Um, so we're gonna ask people to type in questions in the Q&A and we'll be addressing them as best we can. We have about 14 minutes left for questions. Um, we, we heard from Nadia um, talking a lot about scope one and scope two actions um, and Jorge about scope one and scope two actions off their carbon footprint. And then Sarah talked about how technology connectivity um, and you know sectional control and all the technology stacks can really increase profitability for for growers and that's scope three emissions Jorge right it's it's upstream of where you purchase so uh, you know it, it's an interesting conversation and I have my own questions but I think I will turn to the questions on the on the panel here. Um, first one comes from Don McCabe. Does John Deere want or expect to have a role of ownership over carbon credits generated by the farming use of their technology? In other words, who owns the data, Sarah? That's a biggie. Let's see if I can unmute myself here. <laughs> um, yeah, it, you know, it's, it's a good question. And I think the, you know, as, um, as carbon markets are developed further, and you know, I think we've seen a lot of um, a lot in this space, particularly in, in in recent years, as we've started to see more more carbon pricing in certain markets. And as um, Nadia talked about, you know, when we think about carbon border adjustment mechanisms and other types of of measures that may be used. I think the the question is, you know, how are those markets developed, and how are their offsets? Um, and what are the incentives for growers to take advantage to, to take part in a lot of these markets? And it's something that, you know, at, at Deer we're um, we're looking at. We're trying to understand, you know, how are these markets going to be structured? Um, you know, they're they're different across <laughs> different places. And so I, you know, I, I don't I don't think there's really a um, a one clear answer on this. I think from a from a data question that that's a really a really clear clear one and we've been um, you know quite consistent in, in how we view it you know our our customers our farmers they control their data um, they have the ability to share that with third parties um, you know who they choose um, and and that is within their their full control um, you know we try and provide the right value system for data sharing platforms to enable our customers to um, get more insights out of the data that, that is coming off of the machine, be it production data, machine data, or telematic data, um, and ensuring a sort of transparent system so that, um, you know, how any individual data or aggregated data um, gets utilized, you know, from a, an aggregated data perspective that's all anonymized that may be related to machine performance um, factors and things, whereas production data is, um, you know, as I said, you know, farmer control, they may decide to share that with their trusted agronomic advisors or other parties through the John Deere Operations Center so that um, those they want to work with can have access to that to, the, to provide them um, more value and, and services from what they're looking at. Thank you. Um, and I'd just like to point out that, yes, we have those emerging traditional carbon markets, right, with offsets, but then we also have the supply chain carbon of the companies who have been setting science-based targets and will need to track the reduced carbon intensity of the goods they are purchasing from the farms. So you have a pivotal role to play in that as well, Sarah, um, in tracking the, the reduced inputs and, and carbon intensity um, with the, the farmers' uh, companies. Jorge, a question for you. Um, after listening to Sarah, and I, it seems like Grupo Bimbo is spending a lot of time on the scope one, scope two, which are the easier things to control, right? Um, when we get upstream on farm uh, in scope three, um, how are you thinking about, you know, facilitating with your growers and where your suppliers are? Because it's a good story Bimbo has, and you can say to the world that our products have this lower carbon intensity, which is great, but to also go back upstream and say, and our growers as well, um, to you know help them from being trade exposed. Where where do you see that going in the future? 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. You're right. Uh, it's not easy, actually. The scope one and two is not easy, but the, it's it's it's, uh, it's 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 not the, the main problem. You're totally right. In our case, just to give an example, uh, we just uh, with uh, 2019 base, we mapped uh, the, the year on carbon impact, and a group of Imbor now is uh, impacting in 7.6 million tons of uh, CO2. Uh, out of those 7.6, 6.3 comes from our raw materials, scope three. Uh, just one comes from the operations, which is including the factories and as well the distribution. And uh, the, the, the scope three, which is the energy, is just 0.3 because we, we already started with the renewable uh, energy. So our, our main issue, as you, as you already mentioned, is, is, is raw materials. So what we are doing, uh, of course, our, our main uh, raw material is, is wheat. Uh, that, it, that mainly comes from actually comes from from Canada. Uh, most uh, probably eighty percent of our, our uh, wheat source comes from from, from Canada. Uh, but if you take into account all the hectares that uh, we we are impacting, is uh, around eight hundred thousand hectares that we are impacting on, on wheat uh, agriculture. So what we're doing uh, now in, in in Mexico and trying to to roll it out. We work together with with uh, uh, an international center for wheat and corn improvement. Uh, probably you have heard about them. It's uh, CIMIT. Yeah. So we work with them, and uh, lately also uh, Cargill has uh, joined us in helping us in in developing uh, strategies for the Mexican uh, growers to find different ways to, to roll it out in other countries. But we are working working on projects with wheat and, and corn. And as well, other other raw materials that we're using very specific in Mexico, like uh, goat milk for a candy in, in Mexico, uh, uh, um, also cocoa uh, that we are uh, trying to, to to find more re regenerative uh, initiatives uh, for for our growers. And uh, from these uh, findings, that we are we have had a, a good success and trials on on the wheat that we are uh, producing with uh, some growers with the help of, of the CIMIT. Now the idea is to, to roll it out to other places all over the world. Uh, that uh, where is where governments and other companies can help us to, to, to install this and to try this because you know uh, moving grains or moving technologies from one place to another is sometimes you know, it's not an easy an, an easy task. Yes, thank you, Jorge. Um, we come to our next question from Kel Schlendra. How automation and precision technologies monitor soil carbon levels and possibly buildup of soil carbon? I think, Sarah, I might throw that one to you. Sure, and, and I think this is an area where there's still, um, still work to be done um, in, in that space. I mean, there's a lot of different precision technologies or other, um, other tools such as soil moisture monitoring, which can be um, probes you know, put in fields in different places to, to monitor the, the moisture levels given that they vary um, across the field, it's, it's not always gonna be the same. I think that's one thing to keep in mind, um, you know, with, with the field is that the, whether it's um, the soil health or the moisture or all other sort of aspects could be very different um, across different, different parts of the farm. And that's, so that's why a lot of these precision technologies are so important and so that the grower can get a real picture of what the whole field looks like, not at an aggregated level, but really, as I said, getting down to the plant level of what's needed. Um, so, you know, from, from soil moisture, um, compaction is another area of something that, that can get uh, monitored and certainly with um, reducing um, the number of passes that are taken over a field by using um, GPS guidance and auto track um, tools. Those are things that, that help um, support soil health. But, um, you know, I think these, this is an area where there's a lot, of, a lot of work still to be done about how do you integrate other soil health measurements that, say, an agronomist might be doing within um, some of the equipment and other tools that a farmer might be using. Uh, but it's a, it's a great question, and I, I suspect there'll be a lot of a lot of work in that at that area moving forward. Definitely, definitely, and uh, an R and D development too. I mean, our initial panelists said not only technology, Jorge, but R and D and development as well is one of those ways to mitigate the trade exposure of of ranchers and farmers. So. Good job. Um, I'm, I'm we only have four minutes left and I want to hear your thoughts on how can governments who are tackling these policies domestically, internationally, and all of the, the efforts and initiatives that we've heard in the panel before us, 
how can government partner with the private sector and corporates and industry to, you know, if it's about a carbon intensity calculation of a, a good produced in the US or Canada or Mexico, um, and, and being able to verify that carbon intensity, because you guys will be working on the ground with these, you know, eventually getting into your scope threes, and then you provide solutions, Sarah, to scope three. And, and both of you indicated that there should be a seat at the table for industry. How, how do you see it? Maybe Sarah, I'll ask you first, um, in terms of government and industry working together. Yeah, it's a good question, Karen. I mean, I think, um, you know, somewhat N Nadia touched on some of these, this sort of same things. I think it's, you know, transparency and predictability is really important. And I think having a seat at the table is really critical and making sure that there is um, a, a two-way dialogue. I think that's one of the reasons it's so important that we have the broader agriculture sector engaged in these conversations around climate and what are the, the challenges that the world faces. And as we think about food security um, around the world and, and how, do we, um, how do we meet the needs that we have, how do we also ensure that um, growers' perspectives and, and farmers' perspectives are also raised in the discussions with government so that there's a, a real understanding of all the different um, things that need to be considered in terms of, you know, whether it's um, voluntary measures, um, incentive-based programs that, you know, help drive adoption of a lot of these different tools and technologies that we're talking about, um, as opposed to a more um, uh, regressive sort of system through regulation or, or something else. Thank you. Jorge, you get the last word. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I think it's, 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 it is a, it's the most uh, I think uh, uh, companies, uh, we have to take our role and obligation of, uh, of working together with the governments. Uh, as you know, uh, there's uh, different countries, they have different uh, level of maturity and, and development on their policies. So uh, we are forced as, as, as companies, or we, are, we have the obligation of, of participating with the governments on, on ruling, on defining objectives, defining uh, uh, policies that can help on the impact of, uh, on the environment. Uh, what I would say is uh, companies uh, and, and governments together, they should be uh, investing on, on, on training to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to their uh, uh, agro, but as well investing in technology, uh, as, as not just in the biotechnology, but also in terms of uh, digitalization of, of, of automation of the corps and, and all the work that uh, is in the, in the agro sector. So in that way, uh, companies has to, to lead on this, uh, making trials, helping the small companies to grow in that, in that case. And uh, in that way, trying to, to jump from, from small trials up to big ones. But it's, it is a most uh, companies, not just because it's a policy or it's a rule, or it's a government requirement. Uh, it's because it's something that is, is needed to get our businesses sustainable in the future. Excellent. Thank you very much. And thank you, Sarah and Jorge for your time and Nadia, wherever she is chasing COVID. <laughs> and I think I will now turn it over to Martha. Great, thank you everyone for that great discussion. At this time, we have another short break. The next session and our final one of the conference is trade policy and climate measurement implications. Uh, that starts promptly at 2.45 p.m. Central Time. So make sure you return to the event hub and join that session using the blue view session button. Thank you.